Welcome to this morning, 31st of January. Wow, we've made it to the end of January. Can you believe it? And on that note, I have a very sneaky little side mama thing that I'm going to slip in, but I know all of you other mums out there would do exactly the same <laughs> if you were in my position. It is my daughter Ella Jane's 10th birthday today. So happy birthday, Ella Janey, my love. I hope you have a great day. And now the whole of South Point Church knows as well. <laughs> so anyone else with birthdays out there, happy birthday to you too. <laughs> so it is beautiful Sunday morning and and we are all going to stand together in our own homes and we are going to lift our hearts up to God because it is an awesome way to connect ourselves with um, God and to focus on how great God is and all the amazing things that he has done in our lives. So the first song we're going to be singing this morning is called Abundantly More. I'm sure you all know it. Up on your feet, give your spouse or your kids a high five and see who can outsing each other. Through the fire always speaking Just the world I see all the shaking Yes, our God cannot be moved yeah. In a world of hate and vengeance Your word speaks of forgiveness Yes, our God cannot be moved Yes, our God Cannot be moved Unshakable love Unshakable love Your kingdom forever stands Your love it has no end Unshakable Hope of our salvation One breath in the dead Awaken your sucker Cannot be moved Full life is what you offer It's not found in any other sucker We can find all the hope and all the strength and all the love that we need in Jesus. Let's sing together.
There is healing in the power of the Lord Most High. There is courage in the shadow of His wings. There is peace unending over all my life. There is freedom that washes over me. I find all I need here in Your presence, Lord. I open up my soul and You feel. Jesus is alive and he is our living hope. Let's sing. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written 
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages set down from glory. And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my Lord just want to echo those words again and again. Thank you for being our living hope, Father. Thank you that you're the name above all names who we can trust in and that your love is unconditional. And because of that, Father, we have a reason to sing and we have a reason to be happy, Father God, and just be positive. So we want to thank you for those things and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks so much to Talani and the band. I hope you all were up on your feet and energized and ready for the rest of the service. So, as I mentioned last week, if you were listening, we are calling for volunteers because we need you. And um, we know that if your heart was beating last week, I'm sure that you popped Chris an email to say, I'm here and um, I would love to volunteer. We have got controlled environments of people who are getting together in small groups to do all the behind the scenes things that um, need to be done to get church online happening. 
Because although you're not physically here in the building, trust me, there is a lot going on. Um, and we need so many different people from all sorts of different things, whether you're good at tech or you're good at lighting, um, or you just want to stand in and help and check people in, and or if you have a heart for kids ministries and you would love to um, be involved with setting up things for the, uh, the kids ministries online, we really, really need you. And I have a personal challenge out there, especially for all you women, because I volunteered my husband about 10 years ago, <laughs> and I think he volunteered initially, I put him in the tech for Upstreet. Um, and most of you know who he is, because he's always standing outside of Upstreet on a Sunday morning, very often dressed up in crazy, wacky outfits. And um, <laughs> he needs to be upstaged, okay? There is someone out there who can do a really, really good job. So I put a personal challenge. If you think your husband or your boyfriend or your partner can upstage my husband, I would love to have him volunteer or you to volunteer him, please, on his behalf. <laughs> I can't wait to see who comes up. So um, volunteer, please. We want to have you involved. No matter where it is that you feel your heart is, we've definitely got a place for you. And we're looking for you. And we'd really love you to join part of the team. So we are starting a brand new one-parter series today that Chris is going to take us through, and it is called Wild Goose Chase. So if you have ever wanted something really badly in your life and always having a heart to chase it, especially like in our day and age, we're taught to be grateful. Everyone knows that you've got to be grateful for the things that you have, but your heart still wants what your heart wants. And in this series, um, Chris is going to take us through a path that leads us to what we are actually looking for. For. So listen up close, and we're going to hand straight over to Chris. Well, hey, South Point Church. I just want to say good morning to you guys, and it's good to be here today. It's good to be in front of you. It's good to talk to you. Uh, one of the things about the lockdown and COVID that I do enjoy and that I like is that I get to be in your living room or wherever you are, you're watching this. I, I get to be on your screen. I get to be with you. So we can kind of pretend that this is a bit of a, like an intimate environment. So this week, we're doing a one-off message. It's called Wild Goose Chase, and I'm very, very, very excited to bring this to you. I believe that this is something that can, that can change your life. In fact, I believe so deeply in the message that I have to deliver to you today that I believe that if you give it a chance, it 100% has the ability to completely change your life. And so we're going to jump into it right now. The thing that we're talking about, the thing that this message is, is about, this, this Wild Goose Chase message where I want to start is, is everyone, this is around this concept of everyone wants more, okay? Everybody wants just a little bit more. And this isn't a bad thing. So let's talk about the good things about this. So for example, the more that people want has produced some amazing, amazing things. Because people want more, guess what? We put a man on the moon. Because people want more, we've been able to explore the deepest depths of the ocean, because we want more, we have technology that's pushed us to the outer limits of anything that we could have thought of. I think it's always interesting to speak to a great grandparent who was around when they didn't even have a computer at home. And now we have these, what would have been beyond a supercomputer on our telephone and it's, it's right here in our pocket. And that, become, that, that comes because people want more. Like this more, this desire for more, it's, it's driven us to do amazing things as a society. We've come up with vaccines while we're talking about COVID. We've come up with cures for cancer. We've come up with cures for allergy medication. Amen to that. I'm on allergy medication and the guy or the woman or the team that created what I'm on has brought me life. And it is a good, good thing. So again, it's, it's this more that's driven society and culture to do amazing things. The more also has driven people to become amazing people. You know, I was watching a documentary with Casey and Leifa, and it was about LeBron James. And LeBron James, if you don't know, is a basketball player from the States, and some would say he's the best basketball player in the world. Um, long time ago, he passed Michael Jordan's stats, and I, I know there may be some people out there that will argue about whether he's the best or not, but... The documentary was great because it talked about where he came from and how hard he worked. And it was really good for Leifa, my son, to watch that because he got to see that there's this man that's at the pinnacle of a sport, but he didn't start there. The way that he got there is he came out of, out of having nothing and he rose his way up. 
and he got better and he got better and he got better. And when he became the best center, he, he made himself the best point guard. When he, he became the best point guard, he made himself the best forward. And he just continued to want more. This desire for more made him amazing. You know, we also see it in people like Nelson Mandela. Mandela wanted more. When he sat in his prison cell, and you'll have to forgive me, I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but I've, I've tried and I've tried to learn some. And from what I've learned about Mandela is that when he sat in his prison cell, he made the decision for a better South Africa. And when he got out of prison, he continued to make decisions for a better South Africa. He wanted more, not just for himself, but for this entire country. He wanted more. More has produced amazing things and it's produced amazing people. But that's not always the more that we deal with. And so today we're gonna to talk about a different kind of more. So we're gonna shift gears here. Now I didn't start you with the positive so that I can drop a bomb on you here, but it's important that you understand that this desire for more doesn't always have to be a bad thing. It can also be a really good thing. But what happens is, is, is our more that we carry every day, it comes from a deep, deep place of unanswered questions. It, it comes from, from a life of dealing with really, really hard things. The more that we deal with every day, it comes from, from unmet expectations. It comes from hurts. It comes from wonderings. It comes from empty space inside us. It comes from hurts. It comes from all these hard things. So we, we deal with all these, these hard things in our life. Like life is hard. Hard things happen in life. That is just the simple truth. My dad used to always say, there's two things that you're gonna do no matter what. You're gonna pay taxes and you're gonna die. Like, thanks, dad, I'm 10. You know, we should tell appropriate jokes, dad. <laughs> You know, the third thing in that I would add is that life is gonna hurt. It's gonna be good, but it's also gonna hurt. And as those hurts and those hard things have begun to pile up and to, to, to kind of like rub up against us in life, we search for more answers. And a lot of times those answers are unobtainable. They become unanswerable or unobtainable things. And because they're unanswerable or unobtainable, they sort of just get pushed into this space inside of us. And we just keep asking, well, is there more? There has to be more. So we want more help with the more problems or the more hard that we feel because we want it to feel less hard. We want it to feel less. We find ourselves asking the question, I know we've all been there. I know that you've been there. Okay, I know you have. I know that, that you've been there. I know that you have, just like, just like I've been there. We ask ourselves, is this it? Is, is this it for my life? Is this it for my purpose? Is this, is this it for my marriage? Is this it? Like, is this all that there is to it? I know I've had a lot of hard nights, hard days. I've had a lot of times in my life where I find myself doing something and I realize like, oh, this is not what I expected. My life is not meeting the expectations that I thought that it was gonna have. And I wonder like, God, is, is this it? And so I know in my journey, and I know probably in your journey, we go on this quest for more. And so today what I wanna do is I wanna bring an answer to the quest for more. I wanna help you guys and, and me as we work through this to find an answer to that. So what, what I'm not gonna do is I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna give you a false hope. I'm not gonna give you this little three-point sermon where, you know what, if you do these three things, then it's gonna point you in the right direction. Or if you do these five habits, then you're gonna take care of, of your, your hurt. Or to be satisfied in your life, you just need to do these four things you know, our society and our culture is too quick to put us in one of those boxes where we say, you know, hey, if you just do this, it'll take care of, of this. And I'm not gonna lead you down that pathway because I don't believe that that is the right pathway to lead you down. I don't believe that that's gonna give you the long-term solution. I don't believe it's gonna give you the long-term help that you're looking for. So instead, what I wanna do is I wanna help you get the right kind of help. I wanna help you to get uh, help that actually helps, help that helps for, 
for a long time. I wanna put you on a pathway that takes you on a journey that leads you to a healthy place so that no matter what life throws at you, no matter what expectation is it met, you're gonna be able to get through it. You're gonna be able to see, and you're gonna be able to answer this, this quest for more. I'm also gonna show you what you were made for. And towards the end of the sermon, this is my favorite part where I get to show you what you were made for, the more that God made for you. But we'll get there. Um, right now, we're gonna take a bit of a, an interesting turn. And I wanna ask you guys a question. You know, Since the message is called Wild Goose Chase, has anyone ever tried catching a goose? You know, our, maybe our, our tech guys can get that picture turned the right way. Um, you know, on the screen here. But, but if not, we can all just turn our heads or you can pick up your laptop and you can turn your laptop up. Oh, maybe they're working on it. But nonetheless, a goose, I, I, I find it amazing to think that something with two web feet and no hands can be as terrifying as a goose is. I don't, I don't, there we go. I don't understand how this little thing right here can actually be responsible for breaking someone's nose, breaking someone's arm. I don't understand how something that weighs between three kilograms and seven kilograms can come at a grown man and force a grown man to run, to run away. You know, I'll tell you right now, I am absolutely terrified of this bird. I also don't like chickens. I don't actually like any flying bird that has any weight or mass behind them. It's too unpredictable. There's a little dinosaur brain in that thing and it's hardwired to just eat, kill, murder, and destroy. You know, in fact, growing up on our university at school, there was a, it was common knowledge. It had a, a, like a goose infestation. And at the university, it was, it was not a surprise to see people standing somewhere and to see them... Um, like hanging out and all of a sudden to see this goose make a decision that it wants to stand where those people were standing and then it would run at those people and those people would, would run away. And in fact, as I was doing a bit of a Google search on can a goose kill a human, which apparently is a, a frequented Google search, Google came up with all kinds of suggested search, um, like suggested searches. And a lot of those searches were around things like, uh, people putting out PDFs warning people on what to do if a goose attacks you. So did you know that if a goose attacks you and flies at you, you are to keep your body turned towards it, but pivot at a 90 degree angle to it? I just thought, this is crazy. A, a college campus has had to put together a PDF document to tell people how to keep themselves safe from, from a goose. So if you've never had an encounter with a bird like this, then consider yourself lucky. It's like a miniature ostrich. You just don't wanna, you don't wanna deal with it. And this, this here in the picture, I think is a, is a Canadian goose. Um, but speaking of goose and speaking of wild goose chase, the, the phrase wild goose chase actually was coined in the 16th century. And what it was, I thought this was pretty interesting. What it was is it was actually a racehorse. So what they would do is they would put a, a lead horse out and, and put it out on the run. And then you would have mounted horses that would go and they would try and chase and catch the lead horse. So the reason that it got the term wild goose chase or goose chase as a game was because when the horses would pursue the lead horse, they would sort of form a V formation, just like geese would when they migrate and they fly in a flying V. Now, if anyone out there is around my age, you can't think of like ducks or the flying V without thinking of the movie Mighty Ducks. And that has nothing to do with this sermon. That's just to put out there for you guys that are thinking it and it gets it out of my brain. So now I can, I can move on. So that was where the, the, the term goose chase was coined in the 16th century. But then believe it or not, it was Shakespeare that actually got the credit for using the term wild goose chase figuratively. And he did that in his play, Romeo and Juliet, in the original script for Romeo and Juliet. And I tried to look that up and read that so that I could maybe impress you guys with my old English reading and, and read that, that part of the, the play to you, but I, I couldn't understand it. So it makes my heart hurt for any literature majors out there that have to learn 
how to read really, really old manuscripts and things like that. But Shakespeare does get credit for being the first person to figuratively coin that term. So now today, how, how, do we, how do we take the term wild goose chase to mean today? Well, today what it is, is it is someone, so a wild goose chase is when someone is in pursuit of something that is difficult to find or obtain to the point that it feels like a waste of time and is pointless. So this, this is a kind of a lot of words and a, a little bit of a complicated uh, definition, but it's basically saying a wild goose chase is when someone is, is going after something that's either difficult to, to, to get or, and it feels like it's just wasteful and that it's just, it's pointless. It's a waste and it's pointless. So some of the ways that we use the term wild goose chase today is maybe, um, you know, there's, there's funny ways that we use it, but it's like a lot of the times when we're trying to send people on a wild goose chase, it's like we're sending people to go do something that we know is unobtainable. So I'll give you guys a, a story about myself. I'll kind of, uh, this is quite telling, but when I was in college, I worked in a restaurant and I worked in the kitchen and it was a, it was a really nice kitchen and it was a great job. And I was working construction during the day, going to school. And then at night I was cooking in this restaurant and I was learning sort of everything, you know, all the, all the kind, of, kind of like how to be a sous chef in this restaurant. And one night we were really, really busy. And the guys, they said, okay, Chris, you need to go across the street because across the street was a, a sister restaurant that they owned. And so oftentimes we would go across the street to get things or to get equipment or they would come to us or whatever. And so they say, you need to go across the street and get the chicken stretcher. And I thought, okay, you know, chicken stretcher seems like something that's um, normal. Seems like something that's like a real tool, something that's used. And I know that we cook chicken that looks like it's sort of flat and stretched out. So I'm like, I'm gonna be a good employee. And I run across the street and, and run to the, to the back kitchen. And I'm like, hey guys, uh, we need the chicken stretcher over at, at, uh, at Aubrey's. And they were like, what are you talking about? And I was like, you know, the chicken stretcher, we, we need it. It's, you guys have it, but now we, now we need it. And they were like, Chris, man, oh, okay. You need, oh, no, no, no. You need to tell them that we gave it back to them, that they have the chicken stretcher. So then I went back to my restaurant and I said, hey guys, they said that they have the, that they gave it back, that, that we have it here. So then they said, Chris, no, 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 you need to, it's definitely there. You need to go over there and get it. And so I went back again to the restaurant and, and that's about when I figured out that, oh, wait a minute, something's wrong here. <laughs> something's very wrong. And what I found out was that there was no chicken stretcher. It didn't exist. They were playing um, like a prank or a joke on, you know, innocent, you know, little me. And um, that was essentially a wild goose chase. They sent me in pursuit of something that was impossible to obtain. It was, it was, it was difficult to impossible. Now, if I'd found a way to come up with a chicken stretcher, that would have really showed them, but it, it didn't exist. So that was, that was me going on a, a wild goose chase. And the, the point is, is that, is that it's foolish and it's hopeless to search for or pursue something that's unattainable. So why on earth would we search for something that isn't obtainable? Why would we go after something that's not possible? I mean, it's foolish. If you were to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm gonna pursue something or I'm gonna go after something, you know, if you're, if you're this tall and you're gonna, you know, try out for the, the, since we're talking about LeBron James for the slam dunk contest, it'd be like, man, that's a wild goose chase. That's a waste of your time. That's not good use of your time. So I think we can all agree that it's foolish to go for things that are unobtainable. And then if we take that back to life, I think we could say, like, is life a wild goose chase? Is, is life for us a wild goose chase? So who here feels like maybe life is a wild goose chase to you? Who feels like life is maybe hopeless or that happiness is unobtainable? Who feels like that they are, their marriage is hopeless, that happiness in their marriage is unobtainable? Who feels like that that their dreams are un unobtainable. How many of us have let a dream die? How many of us have let our hopes die? 
How many of us have conceded to, this is just what my life is because anything other than this is hopeless. It's unobtainable. So I'm not gonna go after it. But you see, it doesn't have to be that way. And those things actually aren't true. So I'm here to tell you today that the things that you think are hopeless and unobtainable for your life, it's not true. The thing that I know to be true is a reality and a promise. The reality is, is that when we are born, we're born separated from God. We're born completely separate from God because we're born into uh, a sin nature. We're born human. We're born um, with sinful hearts. We're born separated from God. God is perfect. We can't come into communion or relationship with God until we make atonement for our sin. And so what God does is God sees that our relationship with him is, is actually completely unobtainable. And so what God does is he makes a way for us. He knows that we need him because he made us to need him. He knows that, that we were made to have a relationship with him. So he made a way for us to have a relationship with him. God made a way for us. I mean, we may look at life like it's, like it's a wild goose chase. You know, we may look at, at God like pursuing God is a wild goose chase, like it's completely unobtainable or it's hopeless. We may try and pray and think that, man, these prayers, these things that I'm sending up to the sky are completely unobtainable, that's hopeless. It's a wild goose chase. But I wanna spin that around on us one more time. So I wanna say, okay, what, what is the goose that we're after? That's, that's the easy question to find here. If, if we, what, what is the goose that we're after? What is it that we're after? But the more important question is actually this question that's on the screen here. And it's, what if we are actually the goose? What if we're the ones that, that are the goose? I mean, think about that for a second. We spend our whole lives thinking we're chasing something that's unobtainable. We, we, spend, we spend all of our time thinking that, that our hopes, our dreams, our marriage, our jobs, all this stuff, we're going after it, we're trying, we're striving, we're doing all these things, but they just feel unobtainable. Our kids are sick, we're sending prayers up to heaven, our relatives are sick, we're saying, God, we're praying, we're praying, can you help us? And we're just throwing everything out there and everything just feels hopeless. It feels unobtainable. It feels like, man, what is this worth? This is like a wild goose chase. I'm chasing after something that I feel like is unobtainable. But what if it gets flipped around? And what if we consider ourselves as the goose and God is the one that's chasing after us? So are we making ourselves obtainable to God? Are we doing something to take God's yes and turn it into a no. And by that, what I mean, and I want to clarify that, is, is are we closing a door on God? Are our hearts hardened to God? Are our minds hardened to God? Has God been speaking to us for so long and we've been ignoring him for so long that now we can't hear him at all? I think individually, we all have to ask ourselves, well, what if I'm the goose? And instead of me chasing something, what if something is chasing me? And if there's a God, and if God is chasing me, then am I making myself obtainable to God? Now, that's, that's kind of a hard question that really makes you examine, like, what, what is it that you're doing in life? What is it that you're doing with your life? What's going on in your heart? And I know that when I was writing the sermon and I thought about this, turning the question around to this, I myself had to just pause and think like, oh my goodness, I've never thought about it that way. What if I'm the goose? And I know that there are situations where I am the goose. And so what I hope that we can do is I hope that we can stop chasing our geese. And I hope that, that we can stop being the goose that is running and needs to be chased. And what I would like to do instead is I would like for us to learn how to be caught. And that solves the whole problem. You see, when we stop being the goose, then, then what is it that we do? 
What's the next step for us? So I think it's important that you understand this. This is where we start to get into, into the meat of this right here, into, into the thing that makes this message so special. <clears throat> is you, you have your heavenly father, you have the heavenly creator of the earth and he creates man and he creates woman and he makes them after his own image. And then because of sin and because of the world, there's a separation between God and man. And so now there's God who is perfect and you can't come into God's presence unless you're, unless you're also perfect with him. And then there's us that's forever sinful and we can, we can never do anything to make up for all of our sin. Those of us that try and do that, we struggle with guilt and shame. And we think, well, if I do one more thing, it takes away the guilt or the shame or it makes up for it or this or that. But it doesn't, it never does. And so instead what we have is we have this, this chasm. We have you here and we have God here. And what God does is God made us so that, so that we need Jesus to get to God. And so there is no person on this earth that God is not in pursuit of. There's no person on this earth that does not deserve God's grace. There's no person that's outside of God's grace. People ask us as the church all the time, Chris, what would the church do if somebody that chooses this lifestyle would come into church? Chris, what would the church do if, if somebody that does this and this were to come into your doors? Chris, what would the church do if you have somebody that believes this thing or this thing and they decide they wanna come and be a part of South Point Church? You know, my answer to them is, is this, is there anyone that is outside of the grace of God? The answer to that is no. So what that means is that there is an open invitation for every single human on this earth, on this planet, everyone in jail, everyone in a nursing home, everyone on the streets, everyone in their right mind, everyone out of their mind. The invitation is there for absolutely every single person. God's grace is there for every single person. His pursuit is for every single person. You know, my, my hope for this church is that we, we're a huge church. I wanna be a big church. And the reason that I wanna be a big church is because I don't ever want to stop taking the message of Jesus out. That I feel like every single person on earth deserves to have the opportunity and the option to, to come to Jesus. They have that opportunity. They have that option. They can come to Jesus. Philippe, why don't you go back a slide for us? Thanks, buddy. You know, it's really, really important that you guys understand that you have the option to be caught. See, there's that word caught by the love and the grace of Jesus. You, you in your chair, you have that option. You can stop running. You can stop being chased. You can stop chasing the goose. And instead, you have the opportunity to be just flat out caught by Jesus. And that, that's, that's the opportunity that I hope that we, we present to you today. So now, what does that mean for the church? So now we get into this here. What, what exactly does that mean for the church? Well, you know what it means for the church? It means that we have good news to tell. It means that we as the church, we're gonna build a place for people to become pursued. So we're gonna build a place for people to be pursued into Maybe God wants to chase all the little geese into the pen and the church is the pen. We're gonna do our best to build the fence that, that allows people to stop and find a place of rest and find water and find food spiritually and, and to find an opportunity to meet with their creator. That's what the purpose of this church is. That's why we're here. We're not here to judge. We're not here to tell somebody they're right or they're wrong. You know, if you're worried about being judged, you can come to South Point Church because we're not gonna judge you. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. The thing that matters the most is that we as the church do what Jesus commanded us to do when he sent the disciples out. And he said, go and make disciples. That's what he asked them to do. 
And that's basically, we're doing for others what God has done for us. So God reached down to us, the church, and saved us and reconciled our sins. And so we're gonna create an environment for every single person in Cape Town and beyond to come into these walls and have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And we are not going to get in the way of what God wants to do in those people. And so now what does this mean if you're a Christian? So that's what it means if you're the church, but what about Christians? Well, maybe you're a Christian who's discouraged. Maybe you need a reminder. Maybe you need to remember what it was like the day that you gave your life to Jesus. Maybe you find yourself in a place where you don't remember the voice of God. You've not heard the voice of God in so long. Maybe you say, God, I gave my life to Jesus so many years ago, but I haven't felt him. I haven't heard him. My relationship with him isn't very good. I don't even have a relationship with him. You know, can I challenge you to to take yourself back to that day or that moment? Maybe you bent on a knee. Maybe you prayed. Maybe, I don't know how you did it, but you gave your life to Jesus. You know, as a Christian, you're somebody that's handed your life over. Well, guess what? When you do that, God changes you and you don't take it back. That's, that's, That's something you've stepped into a relationship with and it's yours. And then he walks with you forever. And so I wanna remind you, that you can always go back to that moment where you found God. And then God does this really cool thing. And in this really cool thing, what he does is he equips us, he equips Christians with this really neat thing. It's called the Holy Spirit. And we're gonna read in Romans 8, 26 and 27. And it says this, and in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. So the Holy Spirit in our frailty empowers us in our weakness. For example, this is is where it gets really cool. At times, we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for, but the Holy Spirit rises up within us to within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. Verse 27, God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones in perfect harmony for God's plan and our destiny. What does all of that mean? What that means is that God sends us a helper, that when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us. When we don't know what to say, when we don't understand, when we don't know how to express where we are, when we're hurt, when we're lost, when we've lost our way, when we're chasing geese, we can come to God, we can come before God, we can get on our knees, we can sit on our bed, the floor, wherever you are, in the car, and and all. you don't even have to know what to pray. God makes it so simple for us. You don't even have to know what to pray. You just sit there. And the Holy Spirit, this thing that God gives us, It intercedes from within and it sits before the throne room of God and it it talks to God for you. Do you see this? It's like cheat codes for life. You don't, you don't, God, God makes it so simple for us. As Christians, he makes it so simple. He gives us this gift, the Holy Spirit, and it goes before us. It goes before the throne room of God. Next time you're in a crisis, next time you find yourself in a low, next time you find yourself just laying on the ground, who's had an emotional or or whatever breakdown where you just laid on the ground? I have in a couple places, bathroom, living room, carpet, tile. I'm a personal fan of carpet over tile or hardwood, but I've been on all of them. And in all of those moments, I try and remind myself, and when I can't, my wife reminds me of this, that in those moments when I don't know what to pray, when everything feels impossible, that I've got the Holy Spirit that goes and sits before God and actually petitions to God for me. It's amazing. And Jesus, he goes on in the New Testament, and we'll go to John 14 here. He goes on and and Jesus tells the disciples about this. So this is where Jesus introduces this concept to the disciples. So Jesus has, has died on the cross and then he's risen and his disciples are around him and he's about to go back up into heaven. And they're like, Jesus, man, why don't you stay? Why don't you hang out with us? And Jesus is like, no, man, I gotta go. Like my time here is done. And they're like, but we need you. 
And so Jesus says this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, helper. He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. This is the helper. You know him, the Holy Spirit, the helper, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So this thing, that's the Holy Spirit. God says, stop chasing geese, get caught. And Christians, you're caught. Church, we're building an environment where people get caught. And when you get caught, God gives you this gift that sits within. If you think about putting a tea bag in water, that tea infuses in with the water. You can't pull the tea out of the water. You can pull the bag out but you can't separate the tea from the water. It's infused. When, when we come to God, he infuses inside of us the Holy Spirit. And then that Holy Spirit that Jesus here says, dwells with you and will be in you. That's the same Holy Spirit that goes from within you, from within your darkest hurts, your darkest secrets, your darkest aches, your darkest pains, those dark moments where you don't know what to say, what to pray, what to do. Everything's closing around around you. That's from within that moment. The Holy Spirit says, I got you. And it goes to God and it takes everything that you feel that you can't express. And the Bible actually uses the word groans. That means it's not a, it's not an audible language. It groans before the altar of God, before the throne of God on my behalf. Absolutely amazing. Most of us as Christians didn't even know that we had that. Now that you know that you have that, I want you to go out of this sermon and I want you to get down and, and I want you to do nothing and let the Holy Spirit work in you. Let the Holy Spirit take what's in you to God. The last person that we're going to talk about is someone who doesn't know God. So what, what, how does this impact someone that doesn't know God? For you, I would say that it's the same thing that I said last week. You are the VIP. You are the most pursued person in the entire universe. You are the person that is fought for. You were the person that Christ died for. There's been a, a battle that's gone on for your soul from the day that you were born. Both heaven and hell want you, but God, Jesus, has already won the victory for you. You see, God, he designed you to need him. He designed you to want more. See, if, you're, if you don't believe in Jesus, it's okay. I'm not here to stress you out or pressure you. But what I want you to know is this aching, this longing, this more that's in you, this incompleteness that you feel, this hole, this thing that you've tried to fill up with money or cars or women or men or alcohol or whatever else that it is, food, this hole that's in you. God put that there to desire him and him alone. And then he made himself the key that unlocks that. So God just slips right into your heart and he unlocks in you an overflowing flood of love and grace and forgiveness. And then with that, he takes away all the barriers. And then guess what? You, someone who does not know God, we take action and you get to take action with that really cool thing called the Holy Spirit. So now we are, we are no longer gonna be the goose. We're gonna give that up. Our action point for today, and we're, we're almost done, and then you guys can go make breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever time it is that you're watching this. But hang in here for the, for the last point. We're no longer gonna be the goose. So if you're listening to this right now, I want you to say in your heart or out loud, I'm no longer going to be the goose. I'm no longer going to be the goose. And you say, well, okay, well, Chris, but you just said like, don't stop chasing the goose. Maybe we are the goose. Well, 
there's an extra step. I'm no longer going to be the goose, but instead I'm going to be the lamb. And Jesus is going to be my shepherd. You see, lambs, sheep, they need a shepherd to do everything. They don't have to worry about anything. A shepherd has to do literally everything for them or they'll walk off a cliff. They won't drink water. They'll, they'll break their legs and they'll walk on them. I mean, a shepherd does absolutely everything for them. And Jesus calls us his good shepherd. He, he calls us his, his uh, sorry, Jesus calls, he says that he is our good shepherd, that we are his flock. So let's stop being geese. And instead, let's, let's become the lamb and let's accept the love from the shepherd that he has for us. So we're gonna make some declarations and some commitments here. And we're gonna make three of them, one for the church, one for, for those of us that, that know Jesus and one for us, those of us that don't know Jesus. And so as a church, we're gonna declare that, hey, we are gonna take action and we are gonna be a church that facilitates an environment where our greatest passion and our greatest care, the thing that we want more than anything else, no matter what's going on behind the scenes, no matter how good or bad something is or isn't, it doesn't matter. We as the church are making a declaration of faith right now to say that our number one priority is that we create a place where people can stop being geese and become the lamb, where they can get to know their good shepherd. That's what we are as a church. I, as pastor of this church, declare that South Point Church is the most excited about bringing Jesus to everyone else. Now, the Christian, those of you out there that that have given your life to Jesus, I want you to declare over your life, hey, I'm gonna come back to Jesus. If If I've gone away from him, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna look at my life and I'm gonna say, am I making myself unobtainable? Am I making myself impossible to catch? I'm gonna remind myself of God's love for me. I'm gonna remind myself of that moment when I gave my life to Jesus. And then I'm gonna take advantage of that Holy Spirit that God puts in me, that helper, that good, good helper. And I'm gonna let it go before the throne room of God on my behalf. Now, for those of you out there that don't know Jesus, this is our last group here of declarations. I wanna give you an opportunity to declare over your life that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I want you to have an opportunity to say, you know what, I like this. I like this idea that I don't have to carry around guilt and shame. I like this idea that I don't have to carry around Uh, a lack of self-worth. I like this idea that I don't have to chase after this idea of, is this all that my life is? I like this idea that I get the Holy Spirit. I like this idea that Jesus died for me. I like this idea of listening to this void that I have and realizing that the things I'm trying to fill my heart with don't actually fill it. And maybe the thing that fills my heart the most is the thing that I've never turned to. I wanna give you the opportunity that if you feel your heart beat now, if you feel God tugging on your heart now, and man, I pray God tugs on your heart. And if he does, I want you to know it's coming from him, not from me, but from him. And if he's tugging on your heart, then I want you to pray and I want you to give your life to Jesus. And it's simple. You close your eyes and you say, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and take my life. I surrender it to you. And when you do that, you take a step towards your heavenly creator, a step that you never go back from. When that happens, all of heaven breaks open in joy and celebration for you because you stopped being a goose and you let yourself be a lamb. And there's a good shepherd who wants nothing more than to lead and shepherd you. So like we end every message, I wanna end this message. Where do we find Jesus in this message? Just in case someone's missed it. Where do we find Jesus in this? Where where is Jesus in this? Jesus is everywhere in this. Jesus is the one that, that is the reason why 
We don't have to be on a wild goose chase. He's the one and the reason why we can come to God. Jesus is the one that pursued us. Jesus is the one that gave us the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one that called us to go out and build the church. I hope that you can see that Jesus is the one that has orchestrated along every step of the way for all of mankind and all of humanity. Jesus has orchestrated every single step for there to be a place and a stop for you to have an encounter with him. That's where Jesus is in this. Now, where do we find us in this? Well, that's something that you have to ask yourself individually, wherever you are, wherever you're listening to this, whether you're part of a church, not part of a church, a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you have fallen away or come back or backslid or front slid, side slid, whatever the Christian term is that you're calling yourself now, I want you to find, ask yourself, where am I in this? Am I, am I accepting Jesus as the first time? Am I coming back to him? Am I helping to build the church to be a place for everyone to come to it? You know where I hope that we find the most amount of people in this? I hope that we have a ton of people that through this message, they find themselves in a place of saying, you know where I am in this? I'm the one that accepted Jesus for the first time. That's what I hope. And so what are we going to do as a church and as people for 2021? 2020 was a rough year and 2021 maybe has also been a bit of a bit of a rough start for people. It's something that we didn't think that it was going to be this way. We thought COVID would be done. Well, you know what? 2021 is not going to be the year of, of being on a wild goose chase. This is the year that we get caught. This is the year that we become the lamb. This is the year that we let God become our shepherd as a church and as people. This, this is our year. This is a year that we're going to do that. Now, I'm going to pray for us and we're going to end. But before I pray, I want to make this announcement to you. If you gave your life to Jesus, now, I don't know how this works online. This is, uh, you know, I thought to myself, are, you know, do we do this online? Do we do a, a call to salvation online? And then I thought, you know what? If Jesus comes back or someone gets in a car wreck or something happens, do I want to? Do I want to have missed an opportunity to present the most freeing, wonderful gift in all of eternity? No, I don't want to miss it. So we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to make it work. If you gave your life to Jesus, if, if, if you prayed the prayer and said, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, and it was your first time doing that, then I want you to do something really simple. I want you to email. I want you to email me, and maybe we can get our editors to put my email on the screen when you guys watch this, but it's, it's chris.lad at southpointchurch.co.za. Email me and I will partner you with somebody that will walk a road with you to make sure that you understand salvation and that you're being discipled, you're being taken care of, and they'll do the journey with you. They'll lead you through your spiritual giftings. They'll lead you through all these things and lead you to baptism and step with you every step of the way. We don't want you to walk alone. We want you to know that as a church, we walk with you. So I'm gonna pray and I thank you guys for this morning. Lord Jesus, I just pray over every, every ear that heard this message. I pray, Father, that you move in a mighty way. I pray, Lord, that you would just, yeah, that you, Lord, that your love and your grace and your goodness would just pour out over this church and over the people that hear this. I pray, Father, that, yeah, that we would just be amazed at watching your mighty hand work in people's lives. We want more than anything for more and more people to become free in you, Jesus, to be able to say that indeed they are free. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you guys and have a great day. So that brings us to the end of January. We will see you in February. It's been so awesome having you all here this morning. So glad that you have joined us. We hope you all have an absolutely fantastic Sunday further. Love you all lots. See you. Bye.